We're gonna kill the black-eyed bastard himself. What? The... You want to kill the outsider? You want to kill God? What a fool you are. I'm a god! How can you kill a god? Well, it may not be the last bit of Dishonored that we ever get. Death of the Outsider is a bit of a letdown ending this Caldwin era, as the developers call it. Feels like it deserves a better ending. Now don't get me wrong, Death the Outsider, it's still Dishonored, there's still the excellent level design, and I'd still take it over most any other games from what came before it, the classic that is the original, the sequel that suffered a bad launch, and had some issues that hold it back just short of a classic status. It is a bit of a letdown. If you are a Dishonored fan, Death the Outsider will still be a blast, but I would feel let down if I bought this game at full price instead of waiting for it on a sale. Death the Outsider feels like something halfway between a DLC and a full game as far as content goes. While not full game length, it's still far longer than most DLCs, clocking in about 8 or 9 hours. I do find it interesting that the game is released as a standalone instead of requiring the base game of Dishonored 2 to be installed. The team did mention that they also released as a standalone if people want to get into the series now, which you could do, but you'd be quite lost if you hadn't played the previous two Dishonored's titles, even though a fair amount of the story here in Death of the Outsider is self-contained. Besides a few mentions in the background, there's nothing here involving Corvo and Emily. That's fine, their stories were wrapped up in the previous two games, and here we're looking to start with Billy Lurk, Dowd, and The Outsider. One thing I really appreciate this game doing right off the bat is the custom difficulty which was also available in Dishonored 2. I wish more games would take this custom difficulty status as opposed to just easy, medium, or hard. There's quite a number of options here and I really appreciate the developers want the extra mile in implementing this. So good job Arcane. As well for my playthrough, I turned off more or less all notifications, mini markers, objective indicators, a whole shebang. I only really needed to turn it back on a couple of times, and these were for just finding where to end the mission. It's so common these days for games to be built around the minimap or objective indicators, so it's really great that this game is still very accessible without them on. So this is going to be similar to my Dishonored 2 video where I'm going to go through the levels, break down my thoughts of it, and hold off on the narrative until mostly afterwards. I never knew what the black eyed bastard wanted. Be careful. In Death of the Outsider, we'll be playing as Billy Lurk. Billy has been a presence in the series since the first game, although this is our first time playing as her. Like in Dishonored 2, she's voiced by Rosario Dawson. She does a pretty good job with it, although nothing that's a real standout in her performance, which is something that the other titles had an issue with. I mean, when it comes to Rosario Dawson, I always associate her with being a little more upbeat and cheery. I associate her with Clerks too, dancing on the rooftop in the tank top. Shake it, shake it, baby. Set a couple of months after the end of Dishonored, Honored 2, Billy heads off to Karnaka to find Dowd, her mentor and a fan favorite, voiced by Michael Goddamn Madsen, who has been the standout performance as both the character and the voice acting for the series. When we last left Dowd at the end of the Dishonored DLCs, he went to live out the rest of his days, looking to atone for his sins and his past actions and seeking forgiveness. His character arc was the best in Dishonored. Now that's not saying much because character arcs in Dishonored are quite weak but his was well done. It's been a number of years since Billy and us have last seen Dowd, so even though his story could have been more or less seen as concluded before, the game could go in many directions here with Dowd as an older man, maybe at the end of his life, and we're there for it. So let's see where the story goes. For the first level, we hear about a boxing club that makes use of black magic and bone charms, so that's our lead of seeking out Dowd, and that turns out to be the case. Dowd has been captured and forced to take part in the fighting pits here, so we have to get him out. Size-wise, this is quite a small mission, and we don't have any powers at our disposal just yet, which is something that Death of the Outsider has baked more into its design. More limitation for our powers and more linear levels. While we no longer have access to the heart to give insight into others in the game, we do have access to listening to the rats. A bit of a nice compromise and a change, although I do miss the heart. I like the idea behind making use of the rats and listening to them, but the execution is a little bit sloppy. The voice is fine, but some of the dialogue here comes across as half-baked and, no pun intended, a bit cheesy in what they're going for. Well, 
while this area is quite small and we don't have our powers yet, there's still plenty of ways around and we could get these hook mines, which are a real fun little addition to the game. You could also chuck them as opposed to just need to stick them on a surface and you could switch between making them lethal or non-lethal. As well, it never gets old of making improvised grenades by sticking spring racers on something and tossing them into a room. Beggar to train him on. Boots ripped him the meat gobbits in a bull. <laughs> On that note of lethal and non-lethal choices, Death of the Outsider does away with the chaos system altogether. I always felt that the chaos system, while an interesting idea, never quite stuck the landing for what it was going for. The first game was interesting in how it implemented the chaos system, although its impact on the ending of making it more or less a binary choice was a bit off-putting. Dishonored 2 did fix this issue of having chaos be less of an impact on the ending, instead with the choices we made along the way playing out more like a fallout ending with the slides and also having our chaos impact that as well. So to have it here abandoned is a bit of a lit down. I could have feel that they could have used it to draw out the narrative, but more on that later. I was hoping the third time would be the charm of really nailing that chaos system, but sadly it was ditched from the game. As well, on other core elements that have been removed, we only have one assassination target, the Outsider. I didn't find myself missing them as much as I thought I would, for these levels still have lots of fun things to do and the objectives are still great, but more or less stripping away one of those core elements of Dishonored, the assassination targets, is a bit of a letdown. There is always a lot of fun and planning of how we want to go about this and how we could do it. So we end up freeing Dowd, if there are any enemies around or still alive, Dowd will wipe the floor with them. So we talk to Dowd and he wants to kill the outsider. We're gonna kill the black eyed bastard himself. What? Wait, why does Dowd want to do this? And why now? How many people have tried to do this throughout the years? Is he aware of the origins of the Outsider, like Emily or Corvo are? Now I'll talk about this more later in the narrative section, how off-putting I found this and it's a bizarre decision. I wouldn't blame the game fully on this. This starts back in Dishonored 2 when the writing team decided to shoot themselves in the foot by revealing the origins of the Outsider, instead of leaving him as this Lovecraftian figure that's up to us for our interpretation. I always wanted to join a cult. All right, if this is what it takes. Before the start of the second level, we're visited by the Outsider, and again, it's a bit of a disappointment that they changed his voice in Dishonored 2 to a different voice actor. It doesn't quite have the same punch and fit that the voice actor did in the first Dishonored. People usually want something from what in the void. But you don't want my mark, do you, Billy? In the days that follow, your trials will be great, Corvo. Seek the ancient. And here, while we're not given the Mark of the Void, we are given Void Artifacts that gives us access to three abilities that we'll be able to make use of. So let's talk about these abilities right now. The first ability we have is Displacement. This is Billy's equivalent to Blink or Far Reach, but there are some interesting twists to it. We have Semblance, where we could take a person's identity for a time, a lot of similarities to the ability of possession that Corvo has, with some differences involved. Instead of actually possessing them, we create a copy of them for ourselves for a time. It's really getting out of hand. Now there are two of them. Foresight allows us to stop time, allows us to navigate the world around us, allows us to mark enemies or key items. So while we don't have as many options as we did in the previous Dishonored games, there are still some nice spins and different twists with each of these abilities and how we could combine them together. Although overall, I don't feel they quite hit the highs of Emily's abilities in Dishonored 2, which I always felt were the best the series had to offer. Another change in Death of the Outsider is we no longer have mana potions, instead our void energy will replenish itself over a period of time. Let's break these powers down a little further. So when it comes to displacement, there's some nice twists and change to the blink or far reach formula that can lead to some really amusing situations. Unless we're using a certain bone charm when it comes to displacement, we first select an area, target it, and then hit a key to execute that teleport. There's also a bone charm that allows you to leave an image of where you were previously that could help you out in combat. The most interesting twist though about displacement is if you displace onto an enemy, this happens. What? What must they know? Holy shit. <laughs> Yes, you take a bit of damage, but there's something utterly hilarious about doing this to enemies. And the funny thing is, it's silent as well, which seems a bit strange. You think someone exploding would get someone's attention. Semblance bears a lot of resemblance, haha that rhymed, to possession with a few stark differences. Instead of possessing a body, we knock them out and leave their body behind. So if you start walking around and someone sees their body, they're going to get suspicious. We have more time to move around compared to possession and we can move at normal speed. 
We can knock out enemies at the same time and use semblance, or if they're already knocked out, we can make use of it. We can only use it once on enemies, and we can't use it on those that we have killed. There's a few scenarios that pop up in the game where we can complete objectives by making use of semblance, and it's something I wish the game went further on in regards to it. It's really fun to be in a room full of enemies disguised as someone with them none the wiser, or in one case, having the objective of our mission handed to us without them the wiser. Finally, there is foresight, which will freeze the time and allow us to dash around and see the world, what we can interact with, from guards to items, and we can mark them. So we could see, for example, where items are located or where guards are looking or what their paths might look like. The whole marking system has become fairly popular over the last few years, and I did find myself using it a few times to get a lay of the land first. An underused mechanic is combining displacement with foresight. We could use foresight to navigate to areas we quit normally, like vents, lay down a displacement marker, get back into range, and displace through it. This is a fun little way to navigate around and makes you feel really clever and something I wish the game made more use of in situations. And while we do get power later on with a new weapon that's akin to Wind Blast, I think the game should give us at least one more power because as enjoyable as these powers can be, it still does fall short of the previous games. As well, we cannot have greater abilities as we could in previous titles, which robs some of the choices that we had to make use of them as well. Now that we have these powers at our disposal, the game opens up more and we have a level that's much more akin to Dishonored 1. We're off to find the location of a knife that supposedly that can be used to kill the outsider. So we have to go find out where this knife is being held. We have plenty to do around here from the main objectives to a whole batch of side stories that we could find from overhearing conversations along with contracts that we could find from the black market. Some of these contracts are pretty straightforward, some require a bit more thicking and require you to go out of your way to do them, but they're all enjoyable, even if the rewards aren't overly huge as a result. Again, no assassination targets, not our main objective here, although we do have some of that in our contracts, but it's still a really enjoyable level. There's the fun bit here of opening a safe that is voice activated, so I thought, okay, I'll just use semblance on the character with that voice, but that doesn't actually capture their voice. But Fun little thing to try out. The third mission, now that we know where the knife is, we have to do a bank job. Before the mission starts, we go through a number of options of how we want to approach this. Now, let's break into this bank. You have many options of what you could do. I took the option of using this potion at the top to pretty much knock out everyone in the bank. It was amusing to walk around this area with everyone knocked out and not have to worry about it, but well, not exactly. If you do make a lot of noise, for example, it will wake some people up. So we do move further into the bank, we do have some Jindosh soldiers to deal with. There is a note somewhere to how to deal with them again, but it was a little further in, so I do wish the game had a note earlier to remind me, unless I missed it, because I did kind of forget of ways of how to deal with them if I were caught. There's lots of verticality and exploration in this level, and there's a fun little easter egg for Prey fans. Once we break into the vault and get the knife, we have a conversation again with the outsider who mentions that Dowd has died? I know that Dowd is dead when you left him on your ruined ship. And you will carry that knife with you to face me at the black center of all things. Why are you doing this? I hope he's just messing with us. We head back to the ship they end level and nope, that's it for Dowd. They had Dowd die off screen. All right, let's talk about this for a bit because I have a lot to say. Now, this isn't the last appearance of Dowd. We will see him again in the void, but why did they do this to him? I don't mind Dowd dying here, you know, of old age, of being put through the fighting pits, which took a lot out of him. I do find it interesting how his end is through father time as opposed to someone outright killing him. But would it have killed the developers to let us be there with him during his final moments? Killing characters off screen is something that's very difficult to pull off well without feeling like a total cop out. Some stories can do so after a number of years have passed and many of these still end up pissing off people and for good reason. Even worse is killing someone off screen who we just recently saw, like what happens here, or like that hack Ryan Johnson who killed Admiral Akbar off in The Last Jedi off screen. <laughs> Unless you're a master storyteller like Cormac McCarthy, please don't kill major characters off screen. What makes this even more frustrating is the beginning of the next mission. There's an audiograph where he gives his farewell speech. It's from rooftops, stealing keys, bribing servants, sharpening our blades as we waited for the right moment. You were proud of what we could do. Could we have just gone this with him in person? Dowd was an 8-2-bit character here. He was a major character in this world. I have no idea why they killed Dowd off screen. Brother Cardoza, at last, I've concluded my study of the hidden archive, especially this silver graph plate. 
were returned to the Royal Conservatory, which was a level in Dishonored 2, to steal some documents that could tell us how to enter the void. This time around, however, we're not dealing with witches like we did in Dishonored 2, but we have the Overseers and the Oracular Order going through and seeing what the witches left behind. I, now, I do not mind the reuse of a previous level, because there is enough changes to it, we have different factions in here now, and it was a well-designed level in the first place. You know, Dishonored did this as well with the DLCs. So the interesting thing here is this is our actual first direct encounter with the Sisters of the Oracular Order. This is a nice thing to find be able to deal with them face to face, as we have only heard about them in the past. The Oracular Order are a huge part of the lore of Dishonored and play a large role in the plot, even though they're more in the background. What's disappointing though is there really isn't any difference in dealing with them as enemies. They're just like normal guards. And their appearance was kind of, you know, I was expecting something more immaculate from the information that we were given about them in the past. That said, there's still some interesting insights into the oracular order here and having the option to just waltz up to their leader here and get the archive that you've come for is a nice use of semblance. Again, I wish this game had more options in making use of semblance like these kind of scenarios. From there, we're heading up north to the final level to enter the void and encounter the outsider. This level is a bit more linear than the previous levels, our previous Dishonored titles, but we still have plenty of options in how we want to traverse it. And it was a very noticeable step up in difficulty than the previous missions. I found myself dying several times here. You really feel like you're out of your element here, as this is completely unfamiliar territory for both us and Billy. We will make our way into the void, and it's a bit of backtracking as opposed to an entirely new area. Although there are some changes with the void factor. Still, it is a bit disappointing. I wish things were a little more out there here. We do have a new enemy in this area, the Envisioned. These things will mess you up royally if you're not careful, and they could tank quite a bit of damage. They're an interesting addition, but they could have used a little more screen time. Granted, they only exist in the void, so there is some reason for that. We eventually make our way down to the original hold, where we have our assassination target here, the Outsider, which we could deal with lethally as Dad wishes. However, if we did some digging around the level and some exploration, we could use the non-lethal option to free him. There's no boss fight with the Outsider, instead it's just a choice we make through dialogue. I don't really have an issue with this because making some kind of final boss or enemy encounter with the Outsider would have very likely been a letdown considering what we know about the Outsider and how he's been built up. And with that, the game's over. Billy goes on, whether having changed or still knowing she's a killer, the Outsider is now gone or is now free 4,000 years later. Hooray! We really don't know how much change will happen now without Outsider and how the Void changes because these are huge implications to the lore and how the future of this world will turn out. That's been Death of the Outsider. While the levels are more linear and we are more limited in selection of powers and other core elements for previous games like assassination targets or chaos systems are gone, the game is still a very enjoyable romp with excellent level design and still plenty of choice in how we want to tackle things. If you're a fan of Dishonored, it's still going to be a lot of fun. And even though I consider it the worst of the titles, I'd still take playing this over a vast majority of games. But now my taffers, let's really dig into the flaws of the narrative of Death of the Outsider, and some ways it could have been fixed. By no means am I an expert of all things narrative, but let's take a crack at it. You know I used to wonder if you'd speak to me. I almost wanted it. Every street kid, every desperate wretch pushed to the edge. They all wanted you to speak to them. Why didn't you? Why me? Now! So before we go into why the plot is quite a bit of a mess and ways we could fix it, let's look at some of the behind the scenes of Dishonored to get an understanding of why some of the choices were made in the plot. One thing that I was aware of beforehand, prior to playing Death of the Outsider, is that a writer for Death of the Outsider was hired because of her tweets. Which sounds like a really terrible idea, because we all know Twitter is a complete trash fire. Oh, by the way, please follow me at boulderpunch1 on Twitter. Someone has already taken Boulder Punch, you mother... So I went and examined what she wrote up about The Outsider, and there is this post from late 2016 about The Outsider. It's an interesting read. It ties into aspects of, like, ancient Greek rituals. I'll post the link to the article below. It's from these writings that were so accurate to what Harvey Smith had envisioned for the character that she was brought on board. So, did this help? Probably not, but it's not the culprit that I see a number of people point to in regards to the noticeable decline in the plot here. On the note of Harvey Smith, here's a quote I came across from his thoughts on The Outsider in a different article. 
but early on in Dishonored 2, like five years ago, I suggested for DLC that we should let the player go into the void and let us players decide if they want to kill the outsider or not. So there you go, the idea had been brewing for a while. From a different article, I found this quote from the level design director of Death of the Outsider is, People tend to think the outsider is God, and that the end of God is the end of everything. But the outsider is more like a god. And there were other gods before him, and maybe there'll be others after him. We don't know. There will always be a void in some way, and the end of the outsider is not the end of the void. It's ending the existence of the void as it is. If they wanted to go this route, that's fine. But the problem is it's in stark contrast to how the outsider was portrayed in the first game. In the first game, the outsider is this Lovecraftian like trickster god that we don't know his true intentions. We don't need to. He wasn't the main focus of the story, but he was there in the background, getting us to ponder on our choices, all while wondering what he's up to. But then the second game decided to take a shift and reveal the origins of the outsider, that he was a victim of circumstance. And I haven't really come across anyone who said, boy, I'm sure glad they revealed his origins. When you make use of something Lovecraftian, revealing the origins or the reasoning is the last thing you want to do. This is where they shot themselves in the foot in regards to the plot with the outsider. So if they did want to go the route of the outsider being more like a god, that there were those before him, be those after him, and that the void will live on, they should have established that in the first game as opposed to taking a different direction to the sequel and ending up where we are now. The other major issue that arose is the motivation behind Dowd wanting to kill the outsider. Yes, it's been a number of years since we last saw Dowd, but why now? Why the change? If you're going to do that, you better have a good reason for it. According to the Dishonored Wiki, one of the novels goes more into why Dowd wants to kill the outsider. But that information isn't in the game. If you want to have expanded material like books or comics to expand the characters and the lore, that's fine. But to leave these kind of key plot elements in things like novels as opposed to having them in the game is very poor storytelling. This is something I've seen in the last several years. Halo and the Deus Ex series have also been victim of this as well. And of course, why now? Has anyone over these last 4,000 years tried to do the same thing we're doing? It's also really funny how quickly this all comes together to getting the pieces we need to kill the outsider. You'd think someone else during that time would have been able to do the same at some point. So with all that said, let's look at some ways that are possible fixes to not just Death of the Outsider plot, but Dishonored as well. The main thing here is remove the origins of the outsider. Take that back. He was a Lovecraftian-liked individual. We didn't need to know where he came from. You have that Elza Rider where what the people come up with will be far better in their head than whatever you could come up with. This is the direction that the first game went, and for whatever reason, the second game, they went the other direction. Another thing, don't focus on the Outsider. And if that's the case, I guess this game can't exactly be called Death of the Outsider. So what could it be instead? Well, deal with the Oracular Order. We've heard about them since the first game, and it's only here in the second to last level that we get to encounter them. The Oracular Order plays a huge part of this world Dishonored. They've always been the background, so to deal with them directly would have quite a bit of stakes and consequences involved, and they could have gone in some really interesting directions. Also link in the description a, a video I found about the Oracular Order and the lore to kind of get you caught up about them. There's a lot of interesting themes and ideas that Death of the Outsider could have done if we explored this way, going against the Oracular Order, who are known for their knowledge of prophecies and divination of the future. This could have been really interesting to have chaos and assassinations in this, and how the Oracular Order would react to our choices. I make for a lot of interesting scenarios. Could we behave in ways that they didn't expect, get them to question themselves, or do things play out as they have foreseen them? That's one possible direction they could have gone. Now, if they still want to focus on the outsider, what are some other things they could have done instead? I still stick with the main point here, don't reveal his origins. Instead, we could focus on going after the cult of the outsider. We can make our way through these levels assassinating members of the cult, or deal with them in non-lethal ways along the way, along with getting insight from the outsider about how he feels about our choices. And depending on our overall choices, perhaps the void weakens, maybe it strengthens, or changes as a result. There could be a lot of interesting consequences. And because it still focuses on more of that Lovecrafting feel, we could have more of a downer or bittersweet ending where we sacrifice ourselves, but we could reduce the impact that the void or the outsider may have on the world. That while we couldn't bring down a god, we could weaken the connection to the world. That could be some interesting things to go about. And finally, let's talk about the relationship between Dowd and Billy. I'm okay with this being Dowd in his final days. Knowing his days are numbered, perhaps he reaches out to Billy to deal with something with the Oracular Sisters, or they call the Outsider, that he wants to deal with before his time is up. And again, we can make use of the Chaos System assassinations and turn the tables, whereas in the DLC of Dishonored, Billy would reflect these choices back to Dowd. Here, we could have the choices reflected back to Billy through Dowd and his wisdom. 
If our came on to get even more experimental, they could have had us play as down for a time. With his weakening state, we could have had some interesting gameplay development where our powers will weaken over time. We have reduced mana, reduced health. Since these games have always been about these powers, having them stripped away from us could be a really interesting insight to show us how down is coming to the end of his days. So these are just a few high-level ideas of fixes I felt could have made for a stronger narrative. Now to be clear, this is hindsight being 2020, knowing all the knowledge that we have of the story. It's easy for me being an outsider, ha ha ha, to make these suggestions as opposed to working on a game with so many moving parts to it. And with that, ends what the team has dubbed the Caldwin era. So what about the future of Dishonored? It's not entirely clear where the Dishonored franchise goes from here, if it goes anywhere at all. With Deathloop on the horizon and Arcane recently being acquired by Microsoft under that mammoth Bethesda deal, will the Dishonored world return? There are elements of it that are appearing in Deathloop. And the team has an outright state that the franchise is done or will be continued. But they do have a couple of unannounced projects in the work. If the story were to continue, it would be with new storylines and new characters. So I wouldn't get my hopes up of seeing any new Dishonored titles soon, but it is definitely much a possibility. In summary, if you're a fan of Dishonored, Death the Outsider is worth your time. Just do know that it has more constraints than the previous titles, and it has a really wonky story. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Check out my other Dishonored videos if you haven't. Check out my other videos on the channel. Subscribe, like, comment. You know the whole shebang. Boulder Punch out.